What's this uh, class that you're offering here now? A way to become a more effective, productive, and happier human being. The 48 ways to wisdom. Wisdom is the essence of a human being's life, as the contradistinct to the animal. Therefore, is the 48 ways to life. Yeah. Now, we believe that the Torah is the way of life, so it's the 48 ways to Torah's will. Whichever way you pick, there are 48 steps to make you into a better Jew and to a far better human being. That sounds great. What's the name of tonight's lecture? The lessons are the six loves. The six loves. Passion and, and, and emotion and taking uh, all that you know to a higher level of intensity. Th uh, Tuesday nights is a regular thing? Tuesday nights, 8 o'clock. Here at the community shul on Pico? Uh, no, here at the Pico shul on Pico. Pico shul on Pico. <laughs> In social life, we talked about the, that the essence of real interrelationships is equality, peer group. Uh, and even when elders deal with the youngers, they need to equalize it to some degree and vice versa as well. Uh, 13, 14, and 15 dealt with the education. And then one of the things that we talked about in education is creating an environment that's educational conducive, that doesn't have distractions, that allows you to really, really focus in on your thinking and on your learning. Uh, with this in mind, these first three steps really, de really details the basic development of every basic human being in almost all facets of life. It helps you to learn how to think. It helps you to make uh, good decisions, as we said. It helps you to gain an education. It helps you to socialize with people. And you're, you're doing pretty well as a person if you've mastered these 15 steps. Uh, and you're moving forward towards a good profession, maybe a good life, maybe a, a nice uh, husband, a good wife, and then, then you're ready to, to really make your life happen. Except in walks two other problems, uh, two other areas of life that present problems. One is the physical and the other is the mental. So Rab Noach explained that the physical all deal with what we call bemiut, moderation. Where moderation means that physical issues were given to us as opportunities and also challenges. Meaning that, yes, uh, these can become problematic, addictive issues. Uh, food, uh, uh, drink, drugs, sex, uh, all these things can become very, very destructive within us, but it can also become enhanced and beautiful if used wisely in what we call moderation. Uh, so we talked all about this. Uh, meeting these physical challenges is what young people do generally when they're off to college at the age of 18. And the 18 years old, then all these issues start coming up, particularly the freedom for all these issues. Followed by that is the mental issues, issues that we all confront at all to one time or another. So we're all, we're all a, bit, a little bit nuts, you know. So I'll give you a, a blockism. One blockism is, is that the whole world is nuts. <laughs> Everybody is a little goofy. The difference between the clinically insane and the functionally fit is that the functionally fit know it. I know I'm goofy. That's why I'm normal. Someone comes to tell you that he's normal, don't trust him. <laughs> he's wacky. <laughs> That's off the top. So mental issues are real issues. We all face them. What are some of those issues? Frustration, ego, Fear, paranoia, depression, the 40 ways addresses them in all different ways, not for tonight's discussion. So now we've met our challenges, and somehow or another we've taken our developmental thought process, our successful social life, our good education, and we've managed to, man to get through all these challenges and come out somewhat healthy, somewhat functional, somewhat decent, we're married, we got a job, we're moving forward, we got a life, we're, 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 we're something, we're somebody, and we're doing something, and we're making a contribution. Uh, the next step in the 48 ways, therefore, is what we call personal. In other words, understand who you are in relationship to all of this. All of this information, all this learning, all of this growth, all of this development has to be assimilated within the personality on an individual basis. I am this rather than that. Self-awareness, which we'll talk about in just a moment in the next step. But self-awareness means, Hamakiris Makomo, do I know who I am? Do I realize what I can be, what I can't be? Yes, I did want to be a, uh, an announcer for the New York Yankees, but it ain't gonna happen. And I mean, uh, I mean, I could've, it could've happened. 
I mean, then I wanted to be center fielder. That for sure can't happen. I mean, I couldn't hit the ball as good as Robert Perry if I tried. <laughs> I those mean, are, the Pros are both nuts because I thought I'd make the Dodgers. One day. Okay, so you see, the reality is you come to adjust to the realization <laughs> of who I am, what I can do, what my talents are, take pleasure in them, Samech Bechelko, all these are 48 ways that help you to really assimilate all this on a personal level and reach the maximum potential you have as a person, and you get happier, more productive, and really filled with achievement. I was going to be Neil Young and Sandy Kopech, both jobs. But you realize that you can't. Okay. <laughs> Figured it out. He's still thinking. Now <laughs> comes, now comes the next step. <laughs> now comes the next step. In this next step here, the cluster is called Ava, love. They deal with emotion. They deal with passion. They deal with taking everything that we do and bringing it to a higher level of intensity and connection. That's what love is. Love and passion is intensity and connection. So we understand that other isms don't demand this. Other religions don't demand this. If you do it, it's great. Other jobs don't demand it. I mean, if you've got a good job and you're a decent worker and you're happy with your salary and you stay where you play, where you want, everything's great. You want to, you want to rise on the level and go up higher in the, uh, in the uh, company's uh, structure and, and, and become better and bigger and greater, then you've got to start embracing. You've got to start becoming passionate. You just can't work nine to five. You've got to work with anxiousness and and seeking out extra work and maybe work a bit overtime because you really love the job the boss sees that wow you're now you're now vice president so you understand that that these are the kind of things that develop within a person that are elective you don't want to be a great person be a good person judaism demands differently the 48 ways teaches that judaism demands greatness you have to achieve the best you can be and highest potential you can be. Therefore, you must embrace it. Whatever you do in life, embrace. Whatever uh, job it is, whatever your family is, and this is very important too. You gotta love Hashem. So we say the very simple issue. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hero Israel, Hashem is one. So now, why does it say Hero Israel? Why does it simply say here? Hashem is one. Because it's the mitzvah. Now, for instance, it says, remember the Shabbos day to keep it holy. It doesn't say remember Israel to keep the Shabbos day holy, because we understand it's for Israel. It doesn't say honor Israel as your father and mother. We understand it's for Israel. Every mitzvah is for Israel. So why is the mitzvah of Hashem Echad for Israel? Shema Yisrael, Hashem Echad, Hashem Echad. The answer is because since Emuna, since faith in God is incumbent upon the non Jewish world as well, Therefore, it is understood that the Jew takes that level of amun of faith and takes it to another level. Where the following word after Echad 1 is the Ahavta, you shall love the Lord your God. Love is only possible for Jewish people. The Goyim can un understand God, fear God, revere God, listen to God, understand no God. But they can't love him. Love, that's for us exclusively. Shema Yisrael. Right. Only Yisrael can do this. And it comes out, Shem Lekeda, Shem Echad. Why? Because of the word Echad. What does the word Echad mean? One. The one and only. As you know, he's explained. The one and only means, I once made this mistake. I said to Rebbe, I said, you know, Rebbe, it seems that Hashem's the main criteria. He says, that's not the main criteria. He's the only criteria. <laughs> As then, so we understand that Hashem is the one and only that's when you fall in love. You don't love two wives, three wives, four husbands. You love one. You can't love three gods. You then you're, split, you're splitting up your love. Love is one. The one and only. Yeah. Um, two questions. Are any other commandments uh, started by Shema? No. Uh, yeah, there, there are Shema. And there, well, um, Shema? not Shema, not necessarily, because the word Shema, you see, really means more than listening. It means to understand. So it's going to say Nasen Venishma next. Uh, right, it, 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 but it's the same thing. Nishma means I want to learn. Nasen means I want to do. Nishma, Nasen means I want to. Nishma means I want to learn. I want to understand it. That's what it means here. Same word. Shema, understand that Hashem is Echad. So the realization is called the idea, a knowledge that has to be. 
with the word Shema. That's the implication of the, of the mitzvah. But the point is, is that the mitzvah has to be, uh, is exclusively for Jews. Non -Jew, I might have thought that non-Jews, if they believe in God, they believe in God is one too. And the answer is no. Why? Because the non-Jews have other things in life besides God. We have nothing else. Everything is gone. You walk into shul with your child, you now let us kiss your child. Why not? Because you have to love God more. Why? Because God gave you the child. You have to understand that everything begins and ends with him. Once you get that perspective, which is the Jewish perspective, then you understand what love is all about. The only one that matters in this world, for me, is Hashem. Now, once we understand that, we understand that the whole idea of embracing and, 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 and putting things together and feeling the, the kind of sense of, of connection, that is uh, elective for all other peoples and all other isms. It's not for us. For us, we are commanded. You shall love the Lord your God. That's a commandment. That's a mitzvah. It's not an, uh, an option. Abbas Hashem is a commandment. So we understand that what God's telling us is shoot for greatness. Become great. That's the idea of what love is all about. Only Judaism demands this. That's why the 48 ways talks about it. Only Judaism says you shall have this powerful experience. Now, this therefore takes everything to a new level. There are six loves. One is to be loved. To be loved, of course, is the position of developing within oneself the personality, the traits, the qualities, the midos that make you lovable. Thou shalt be lovable. That's what the 40 ways is teaching. The message is that can you make yourself a person who, a kind of person who really will find, uh, will, will find favor in the eyes of people. Now, uh, I guess you can use that as some sort of a litmus test also. How well are you doing with that? Are people responding to you positively? Are you people responding to you negatively? You got, you, that's your test, so to speak. But it's also working on yourself as well to really get a perspective of how I am doing in this world. And at the end of the day, it really means you gotta love yourself. Now, in order to understand this better, I tell the story of Moshe Rabbeinu at the Sneh. Moshe Rabbeinu is at the burning bush, and Hashem reveals himself and tells him, I want you to take the Jews out of the tribe. And it's like, and Moshe Rabbeinu responds and says, who am I? What Moshe Rabbeinu is saying is, more than just, who am I, am I to want, why am I selected for this job? Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, I don't know who I am. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu is a man who's lived a life of total confusion. Born from a Jewish mother, saved by an Egyptian mother, brought up in the palace, and yet nursed by his Jewish mother, and Paro is his role model, and yet he's upset with the fact that Jews are being enslaved. So much so that he kills a guy who, who, who beat on a Jew. Man's living a real confusion. And is running away to Midian. He's not running away necessarily to save his life. He's running away because he doesn't know how to deal with his issues. He's looking for some sort of what we might call today in the Hasidic world, he's bonus. I need to be alone to figure things out. I'm going to the beach and watch the ocean and the waves. I'm going to the forest and see the mountains and the trees, which I brought my people did. Same, side of, same sort of self-discovery. And it's not just the discovery of God we're looking for, we're looking for myself. Because at the end of the day, what, what, whatever I'm going to discover, the first need, need is to discover me, because that's the only one I know. What am I all about? Now, Moshe Rabbeinu in this confusion sees a phenomenon which mirrors his confusion. A bush is burning and it won't burn down. That's confusion. That's me. There's got to be an answer there. i got to see this. And of course, he gets this revelation from Hashem. He gets this revelation, this discovery. And in the discovery, the first question is, who am I? Self-discovery before anything else. Before I deal with other people, before I deal with God, I gotta deal with me. So Hashem says, You wanna know who you are? I'll tell you who you are. Now, how does that answer the question? How does I'll be with you answer the question of who you are? The answer is very simple. God is telling you, <coughs> you, to be honest, are nothing. You're zero. 
you're a creature that I created and that I gave you a start and I can end it to you at any moment. You want to know who you really are? I'll tell you now. I'll be with you. In other words, if you don't live a life with me, you're nobody. You live a life with me, you're somebody. Without me, you're nothing. With me, you're everything. That's what Hashem is telling my sure Hey, yeah, I'll be with you. The whole greatest power in the world, of the total control of the world, says, I'm with you. Whoa. Empowered. It's almost like Popeye the feeling spinach. <laughs> Whoa. I'm not go. Wow. But there's only one little problem. Once I discover who I am, and it's based upon you, who are you? <laughs> I like to tell the story of uh, the first Superman film. How many people saw the Superman film, right? Very good. Remember that story? So Lois Lane's falling down. Good Superman song. discovers him, uh, 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 discloses himself for the first time. See that movie? He runs out of the, he flies up there to get to catch Lois Lane, and he says, and as he flies up, catches her, he says, "I got you." And she says, "You got me? Who got you? <laughs> I got me. I got you." He's no, there's a sense. Most of it is like that. They're telling me that you. You're everything. You're, you're going to be with me. Who are you? The second discovery is God. If my reality is God, who are you? So he discovers. So Hashem answers that and says, "Okay, I'll tell you why." I'm forever. I'm eternal. Nothing can stop me. I have no beginning, no end, no limitation, no place. I'm the Almighty. I'm the total control of everything. The total reality. So once Moshe Rabbeinu understands this and accepts this truth as the spiritual discovery of the invisible that's around me, that's in fact a reality, he says, okay, now you want me to take the Jews out of Mitzrayim, and you know, I'm gonna go to those Jews and they're not gonna leave me. In other words, how do I get along with everybody else? How do I handle the Israel? How do I handle people? So that's the whole idea. Discover me, discover you, discover everyone else around me. Love begins with me. Love God, love everybody. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Who should you love first? Come on, yourself. So the poor man knocks on the door and says, Hello, I'm poor. I didn't eat dinner tonight. Can you help me? And I look at him and say, I didn't eat dinner either. Get out. That's loving your friend like yourself. It's ridiculous. you got to make sure that you eat dinner. Love yourself first. Then you can love others. But once we understand that, Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, you can love Klai Yisrael, you understand, if you understand yourself and your relationship with me and how I empower you. With that in mind, and you see your intrinsic goodness because you're connected with the intrinsic good, then of course, you can shower the world with good and the world will respond to you. Avas Yisrael, love humanity. But we understand another issue about loving humanity. And that is called the author of the you should love your friend like your friend, like yourself, is the shot that your friend should be someone whom you share mitzvahs with, a fellow Jew. Doesn't imply a fellow non-Jew at all. But yet in 48 ways it says, I have a We shall love creations, people. So if Noah Zakhan of Rach of Blessed Memory explained as follows. Rabbi Weinberg said, Love operates in priorities. There is a higher priority, a lower love, a lower love, a lower love, and they're all loves, but they're lesser. I love my parents. I love my spouse. I love my brothers and sisters. I love my children. I love my Talmudian. I love my cousins. But it all goes on a descending level. Ultimately, I love my people above the fact that I love humanity. But by definition, that means I love humanity. So Yaakov Avinu is tripped and gets the wrong girl. Instead of Rachel, he ends up with Leah. And he loves Rachel more than Leah. What does that mean? That means he loves Leah too. You learn to operate within the scope of love, and in this way, your love is real. Then I have a question. Okay. If I don't like that. Go ahead, go for it. So we, you've heard what you're saying, there's self-love. Right. The Torah doesn't command you to do that, but we can infer that there's a... a the inference. There's a hafta recha kamocha. The, the inference is there. Right. So we have a hafta recha kamocha. We have a hafta, 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 a
The hafta mes hagerim. Right. Supposed to love the the convert, but it doesn't say the hafta mes hagerim. Thou shalt love your parents. Right. So uh, three of these things are are well besides Hashem, like are secondary. Two of those three seem to be to one's own parents. Yet the Torah doesn't command us right. spe in a, specifically to love our parents. Favas nisht. Well, I think, I think the, the issue really is with it's parents. Right. The, the issue is an obligation. When you're talking about command and obligation, your your obligation to your parents is to respect and appreciate and be there for what they've done for you. In terms of love, that's almost unnatural. Why? Because the moment you love God, you're going to love your parents at the same time. Why is that so? Because there are three partners in the human being. And if you love one, then you love the other and the third. The no commandment to love your no, children either. Wait, wait, wait. Right. I, I, Again, but the, same, but the same rule is, what I, do you, you obligate to your children? To give your child a gris, pick in a bed, to teach him Torah, give him a job, teach him how to swim. You know, there are obligations here. But basically what we understand later on is that all these obligations are manifestations of love. Why is that so? Because what's the word love mean? Ava. Have. What's have mean? To give. To give. And at the end of the day, we talk to it, Love is not a feeling ultimately, it is an action. You shall love is a mitzvah, you've got to do it. It's a verb. It's a verb. Not a noun. That's what those major teachings. You don't fall in love. You love. That's the point. Uh, so, this concept of working these, in, in these kind of priorities was a, a, a thing that Noah was teaching within these 48 ways loving yourself, loving Hashem loving people. Now, in so doing, and I explained a little bit of it, the discovery of Hashem is a discovery of a spiritual reality, and that there should be a great pleasure in. So we explained it in the following manner. And Noah said there was five levels of pleasure. The five levels of pleasure include uh, physical pleasure, family pleasure, and upward. In other words, physical is the lowest. So, um, if you have physical pleasure, that's a reality and a good thing, but there are greater pleasures than that. Certainly, the love of family is greater than that. It's greater than a state, and it's greater than, 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 than uh, any other physical indulgence you can think of, better than getting drunk. I mean, it's, it's family, what you have here. You, you, the people that love you, the people that care for you. But there's something greater than that. Third level of pleasure. As we go up with, and that's called the cause, the cause for what people will live for, what people will die for. And the Israeli goes off to war, knowing 50 percent of the chance he can not come back. Right? He goes off to, to the army. He gives. He, he, he's ready. He's, he's ready to, to fight for his family and give up his family for that cause, for the love of Israel, the love of his people, the love of his family, and so forth. As a person, as a father, as a mother. But what would you do for your child? Would you uh, put yourself in jeopardy? For sure you would. Would you harm uh, 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 yourself or whatever you had to do and deny yourself for your children? Certainly you would. If that's the case. Certainly cause is greater than than family. But something's greater than a cause. And that's called power. Power is a pleasure. You remember this from last week, don't you? Right? Okay, a little review. Power is a pleasure that that um, enables me to really move the cause forward, to be able to really do something. First of all, once we become president of the United States, once Trump wants to become president, because he's got this belief that he wants to foster. He wants to get to do these things. He can't do it without the control, without the power. So he seeks it. And it's a great pleasure when you know that I move the embassy to Jerusalem. You feel great about that. You, 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 it's a great pleasure. But then it's a greater pleasure. Because in the end, the power pleasure is an illusion. Because once you achieve it, you relinquish it. Lay malachim the Hashem. The hearts of kings in the in the in the, uh, in, the uh, in the hands of Hashem. What the king ultimately decides is what Hashem wants. Because that's going to determine the destiny of the world. So that's the case. Clearly, what you want to do is you want to have real power. 
was real power. And then you're empowered. And that's what Moshe Rabbeinu found out. So, in this way, we find out that our Hashem is really the greatest pleasure there is. Says the Messiah Hashem, the great Ramchal, what does he teach? What does the Ramchal teach? He says, the man was created, Lehisane, Al Hashem. The person was created to have pleasure with Hashem. That's the tachlis, that's the purpose of living. So now we achieve this here, we have this sense of self, we have this sense of Hashem, we have a sense of Avas Yisrael, loving people. Well, oh, you really love people, love brios. So basically what we talk about there, again, is the priorities. Make sure that you understand how love operates. Who's the highest love? Who's the second highest, third highest? Certainly your spouse is on top. On the top. And the list, I mean, uh, um, uh, certainly uh, uh, there is a, a sense of, of, of your children, of your parents. But then once you have that love operating, then what happens? It begins to extend, almost like an octopus. It goes out and out, it's all over the place. And all of a sudden the love extends beyond you. All of a sudden you love all your Talmudim. You love all the people that you, that you make friends with. And you have a certain level of love for them. You get closer to them, perhaps. And of course, uh, there are others that you don't get that close with, and that you have a little lesser love for them, but you don't, but you have love for them. So what does it mean then? It means that basically, what are you prepared to do? So we say, some of the ways to show love, Rabbi Noach says, one of the ways to show love, first of all, is physical. A person shakes hands, a person hugs, a person embraces. Right? There's a way of physical touch that connects people. Second one, of course, is what they're prepared to do in terms of, I need help. Have a few dollars to the person. Um, you need a loan. You need a, 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 maybe a gift. I'd like to buy you something that you might prize, you know, uh, and stuff like that. But then there's a third, uh, a third level of love called emotional, where you really say to the person, I care about you. You say sweet words to the person. And you do so in a manner in which the person senses your emotional connection and he feels good about that. That's how you love. That's how you do it, right? And of course you want that reciprocation if the love is an operative factor. In so doing, you have this, this, this saying that says, I wanna, I wanna be there for you, uh, maybe you wanna share some thoughts with me, something that really connects people. But then the fourth is a greater one. The fourth level of love is when you share with a person the greatest gift of all, the gift of spirituality. I'm going to help you discover God. I'm going to teach you Torah. I'm going to give you a connection with the spiritual, with the Almighty. That kind of gift is really the greatest gift of love there is. And that's why the greatest gift of love is the gift that a Rebbe gives a Talmud, or parents give their children. Now, these kind of, that's for me, thank you. So, what we want to say here is that um, as we begin to develop these loves, um, we then develop another, uh, another two loves, uh, in, which really is one love. Love of God, a uh, love of... Is that song? I don't know. Okay, you'll teach it to me. Uh, <laughs> um, love, love of self, love of God, love of people. Then comes the fourth love. The fourth love is when Moshe Rabbeinu asks the fourth question. And the fourth question is, you knew that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Fourth love is the fourth question. There are four questions on Pesach, right? Here are the four questions. Who am I? Who are you? Who are they? And there's the fourth question. What do we eat? <laughs> <laughs> well, nearly, nearly, nearly. That fourth question is, in light of these three answers that you've given me, Hashem, now who am I? What am I supposed to do with it? What am I supposed to do with this information of who I am, who you are, and what my obligation is to the rest of life as well? And the answer is, what you're supposed to do with it, is basically follow Hashem's ways and to do that you have to have develop a love of Torah, a love of learning, a love that seeks 
the discovery of God's wisdom. I want to hear more about what Hashem has to say about things. I want to hear how Hashem defines life, the life that He created in the first place. I want to hear that concept of of um, of the truth of the world. I want to hear. I want to hear. I want to learn. I want to learn about God. So that's called learning Torah. So the first thing you learn about Torah is really two things. There's obvious up there. It's called the love of righteousness. Oh, in the in the words of the Mishnah, and the others love the straight road. Oh, in Mishari. And of course, they sound very similar. Uh, what do we say until them? Oh, Zarul at Sadik, well, the Yisrael of Simcha. So there's a light plan for the righteous, and for those that are straight of heart, there's Simcha. So, what's the difference between a righteous guy and a straight of heart guy? What's the difference between a righteousness and straightness? So, here is where Reb Noach explains his problems. To love righteousness is to love and see what we know or we understand as the truth of our world, the truth of how our world operates, and to accept Betzidu Kadin in the judgment of Hashem and the righteousness of judgment that He's doing the right thing and I want to do the right thing. I want to learn how to be right, how to do right, how to follow right, how to make right decisions and do what is proper, what works, what works in this world, what's effective. So in order to learn how to do that, I, I need to learn the mitzvahs, I need to learn the Torah which teaches the mitzvahs, and I need to see the, uh, the, 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 the righteousness of life that I, as Hashem created it, and His righteousness in His world. Now, in order to understand that, we have to appreciate that when God punishes the wicked and saves the righteous, that's an affirmation of righteousness. Once we understand that slavery is bad, we know that the enslavers, the masters, are bad. And the victims are righteous. If Hashem champions the righteous, champions the victims, and champions those that are suffering, takes the Jews out of Mitzrayim, what have we got? We've got this championship of Hashem that says He's doing the right thing. And I can trust on that and rely on that for the rest of my life. In other words, I can see so many things that are somewhat, uh, maybe don't seem, don't appear to be that way. In fact, I can see things that uh, might not be that way at all and challenge Hashem's righteousness. At the end of the day, I see that Hashem is righteous. I figure it out. And that's a lifetime of challenge, lifetime of work to do, but it's an imperative because what it really means is that if you find that God is righteous and that he's the true judge, Diana Emmas, then what you learn or find out is that you can rely on God for safety, for protection, and life is manageable. If let's say it's not within the reasonable uh, uh, control of Hashem, and it's not a reasonable world, so to speak, something that does not uh, uh, satisfy the human mind, then what you have is a world of chaos, a world of mazel. Some got it, some don't. And it becomes so chaotic and so frightening that you will abandon your own pursuit of righteousness and say, well, look, you know, uh, the, the heck with this. It didn't get me anywhere. So well, why should I do the right thing and, and, and live the right life? It, it, it just all got me as misery and suffering. Forget this. Uh, I'm going out to have fun. When I was 13 years old, I went to Yeshiva in Cleveland. Tell us. Tell us from Lithuania, we planted in America after the war, was known as the West Point of Yeshivas. It was the strictest, most demanding Yeshiva of all time, and it still is. And I was misplaced, I didn't belong there. <laughs> I am not that disciplined a guy. 
I mean, I remember paying fortunes of money, paying fortunes of money, what it was in those days, a dollar, dollar fifty, whatever it is, because I didn't make my bed. If you didn't make your bed, you are in deep trouble <laughs> in the dormitory. And then there was a very strict, excuse me, you, dollies start at 7.30, not 7.31. This was, I mean, the Yankees, the, 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 these guys were, were, were straight as arrows. Anyway, I learned a lot there. And it was a great experience. I couldn't last there because I, I was too young anyway. But what was interesting is I saw great people. And I often tell that to people. You know the difference between me and you guys? Very simple. Except for having a third name. I saw, about me? Oh, I knew to. <laughs> I saw emotion. Okay, when you see great people in the world. How do you have seen great people? So you say to yourself, well, let's see now. I saw... A great movie actor? <laughs> oh, that's good. I saw Magic Johnson. <laughs> Certainly doesn't cut it. Well, I saw a great statesman. I saw Bill Clinton. <laughs> a man whose morality is certainly open to dubious questions. Well, it was who I, when you see a Ramosha Feinstein of blessed memory, when you see Gadol Ador of Palm, what are you seeing? You see a Shimer, you see all of them. You see greatness, nobility. The sense of that happened to me when I was in Cleveland. I was 13. And I saw this great rabbi, the Rosh Hashiva, named the Muddle Katz, Zechen al Rocha, Zechen Tzak al Rocha, blessed memory, was a man who escaped the Holocaust, lost a wife and 10 children, came back to America, and was redoubled his efforts to rebuild his life and rebuild Judaism without the slightest question of God. He remarried, had three new children, at a later advanced stage, of course, and he built the yeshiva again, and promoted Judaism again, and promoted teaching again, and promoted learning again. Just like it was, we're gonna just rebuild and replant, as it was. Where do you get that kind of strength? Another person might have said, this is Torah, this is Judaism, forget this. Going through a Holocaust. But you see that when people have a certain sense of righteousness of God because of God's rulings that are certainly so righteous. I look at the mitzvahs and I see that there's righteousness embodied in the mitzvahs. The mitzvahs teach stucca. The mitzvahs teach caring for people. The mitzvahs teach chesed and kindness. The mitzvahs teach a good way of life. Well, the same mitzvah that taught you to give charity teaches you to keep Shabbos. And that's a great way of life too. Having a day off, a day off that we contributed to the world. A major, a major writer for a secular newspaper in Israel complained the other day, how is it that the nations, that the nation uh, that gave the world a notion of a rest day of a Shabbos has its stores open in Tel Aviv on Saturday? Doesn't make sense. The CEO of a major company, he needs to get away. He's stressed out. So he runs to San Diego for a couple of days, except for a little problem. The dummy took his cell phone with him. <laughs> we, I, I don't gotta go to San Diego. I got my shamans. And no cell phone. Nobody bothers me. <laughs> you see? So the idea is that the life makes sense through the Torah. When you love the Torah, you love the righteousness of the Torah. You love the sensibility of Torah. You love the, 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 the fact that the mitzvahs make sense. Something inside you tingles with, whoa, that's real, that makes sense. That's sensible. That's reasonable. You see? And that happens to anybody who discovers or learns Judaism. It doesn't happen anywhere else. When you discuss the Torah, you're saying up shot in the Torah. Well, I want to say this question in this deep and tricky place of the stage of the Talmud in this particular place, and we're working it out and we're struggling for now, and finally figured it out. Whoa, that hits you. What a pleasure. Wow, I got an answer to the question. Because every question has an answer. You gotta work at it. So, really, what we end up saying, what we end up doing, is loving righteousness. And to love righteousness means that. Life makes sense. The lifestyle of the Torah makes sense. And even though there are stumbling blocks and obstacles, it's the only way to go. How could the great Rosh Hashiva possibly do anything else but continue learning Torah, teaching Torah, and living with mitzvahs after his life, even after what he suffered? He can't, there's no way. 
That's the love of righteousness. The beauty of righteousness. And this intellectual and mental pleasure that it gives. So that's why deep down inside everyone has what is called the Ratzon HaToyev. The will to do good. And the answer is, how do we do that? We do that by seeing the ultimate triumph of justice. Now, Yisro was a convert. Yisro has conflict, has has conflict in his conversion. From one side, in his very same word, Vayichad, it means he rejoiced and he's upset. In the same word. And Rashi says the two shot him in the Rashi, the two uh, commentaries, and they're in conflict. Yisrael rejoices over the salvation of the Jews. Yisrael feels miserable over the fact the Egyptians drown. That's a conflict. That's a pretty heavy conflict. Well, where are you? Are you with us or not with us? Are you with the Jews or not? Are you converting or not? What's going to be? The answer is, you see, is that Yisrael had two legitimate, they're both legitimate, um, uh, uh, feelings. But what we were missing was a third feeling. When God saves the Jews and punishes the evil, number one, I am rejoicing. For we, the Jews, have been, have been exonerated and, been, and have been cared for and been proven right by Hashem. And we stand, we stand tall with the recognition that our truth has prevailed over 2,000 years and we got a home in Israel after 2,000 years of waiting. So that concept gives me this great pleasure of sal God sal saved us, the salvation of Hashem. At the same time, I feel bad. The fact that the Nazis were killed. Why? Because the Nazis were human beings that deteriorated the animals that a human being should deteriorate to such a, a level. You gotta feel sad, you gotta feel sad that the that the Zalim uh, al was so absolutely obliterated. It's a sad thing that the Egyptians drowned in the sea when they could have done true me and become better human beings. So those are two legitimate feelings, but there's a third feeling that he missed. And that's what well, he's going to be. What's this? He's coming from that world. One second, one second, one second. 